Okay, so let's continue our conversation about thermodynamics, and we're going to move on to um, the topic of Gibbs free energy. So in this topic, we're going to talk about spontaneity and what exactly determines spontaneity. So a couple ideas here. So we looked at some endothermic processes that were spontaneous. Okay, so this would be like ice melting above zero degrees C, for instance. We also know of processes where delta S is negative, something like the Haber process we just looked at. Okay, so what is it exactly that determines spontaneity for a system? Okay, so what's governing this? If a system that takes energy or a system that has a negative delta S, if those could be spontaneous, so what exactly governs this? Okay, and so this question was first answered by an American mathematician, and he went by the name of Gibbs. Okay, so look, let's look at what Gibbs said. So Gibbs free energy, we give the term big G. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay, let's start from our entropy equation here. So we know that entropy of the universe is equal to delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. So same definition we've been using. Okay. So let's start from there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sub in what we know about delta S of the surrounding. So the same way we calculate it. So minus delta H of the system over T. Okay, so let's just plug that into our equation. Okay, substitute that in for delta S of the surroundings. So we come up with this equation. We come up with delta S of the universe is equal to delta S of the system minus delta H system over T. Okay, well that's all fine and good. Now multiply everything by minus t, and it gives us this equation. So minus t times delta s of the universe is equal to minus t times delta s of the system plus delta h of the system. Okay, and just rearranging a little bit, we can say that minus t times delta s of the universe is equal to delta h of the system minus t delta s of the system. Okay, so if you can kind of see where we're going here, we're putting terms of delta s of the universe, sort of in terms of terms for the system, so delta h of the system, delta s of the system. Okay, and this first term, minus t delta s, we refer to that as delta g, so change in Gibbs free energy. And delta g will be equal to delta h of the system minus t delta s of the system. Okay, so let's take this equation with us. Let's talk about how to actually put that into practice. Okay, so delta, delta G, capital G, is going to be change in Gibbs free energy. What exactly is Gibbs free energy? Gibbs free energy is the energy available in the system to do work on the surroundings at a constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so we're going to hold temperature and pressure constant, and, and Gibbs free energy tells us the energy available in the system to do work on the surroundings. So if we go back for a second, notice here we put everything in terms of the system. So remember, what's being done by the system has to be done to the surroundings and vice versa. Okay, so our definition here, energy, avail energy available in the system to do work on the surroundings. Okay. And again, it's just that constant temperature and pressure. Okay, and delta G is a state function, just like any other state function, we can say that delta G is equal to G final minus G initial. Okay, so nothing super new there. So what's important about delta G is that this value actually helps us determine spontaneity. Not helps us, but it does determine spontaneity. Okay, so since by definition, delta G is equal to minus T delta S of universe, which is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system, we can look at a few things here. So we can say that when delta S of the universe is greater than zero, then minus T delta S of the universe, which is delta G, that's going to be a spontaneous process. Okay, so G less than zero, delta change in delta or delta G less than zero, where my delta S of the universe is greater than zero, that's a spontaneous process. Now, if my delta S of the universe is less than zero, 
and my delta G or minus T delta S, whichever way you want to say it, is greater than zero, that's not going to be a spontaneous process. Okay, and we'll look at why that is in just a second. Okay, so we talk about thermodynamic standard state. Okay, so the most stable form of a pure substance at 1 atm pressure and 25 degrees C, one molar concentration for all substance in solution. Okay, so this is the same knot we've been talking about. So delta H naught, delta S naught. So the same standard state we've been talking about. Okay, so let's look at values of delta G. So coming back to delta G and talking about spontaneity. So if we have a delta G naught less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. Okay, if we have a delta G naught equal to zero, then we have an equilibrium reaction. So it's moving in the forward and reverse reaction direction. If we have a delta G greater than zero, then we have a non-spontaneous reaction in the forward direction. Okay, so the best thing to remember here, I think, is delta G less than zero for a spontaneous process. So if we go back to our definition here, okay, so what do we say here? We said if our delta S of the universe was greater than zero, then we would have a delta G less than zero. That is a spontaneous process. Okay, in the second line here, we said if we have delta S universe less than zero and a delta G greater than zero, that's a non-spontaneous process. Okay, so remember, entropy always wants to be increasing. So delta S of the universe always has to be greater than zero for a spontaneous process or a loud process. Okay, and then for a spontaneous process, delta G always has to be less than zero. Okay, and so the second line says just the opposite of that. Okay, so remember, delta S greater than zero, delta G less than zero for a spontaneous process. Okay, and then that's summarized again here. So delta G less than zero, spontaneous process, delta G equal to zero at equilibrium, delta G greater than zero, non-spontaneous. Okay, so if you know delta G less than zero is a spontaneous process, okay, then you can kind of fill in the rest probably from your memory. Okay, so how do we use this? So suppose we want to calculate the standard free energy change at 298 Kelvin for the Haber synthesis of ammonia using a given values for standard enthalpy and standard entropy changes. Okay, so here they've just gone ahead and given us delta H and delta S, and they've got the corresponding temperature. Okay, so we can set up our equation. So here we have delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. Okay, so they've gone ahead and given us these values. So all I have to do is just plug them in. Okay, so just bring down your delta H. Okay, the temperature we were given. Okay, then bring down delta S. And then they just convert it to have the matching units. So we end up with kilojoules per Kelvin, since we have kilojoules here. So everything matches. Okay, so we end up with negative 92.2 kilojoules minus negative 59.2 kilojoules. Okay, so we have Gibbs free energy of minus 33.0 kilojoules. Okay, so what do we think this would be a spontaneous process or a non-spontaneous process? So remember, delta G less than zero, spontaneous. So this is a negative 33.0 kilojoules, so this would be a spontaneous process. Okay, so now a question for you to try. So it says iron metal can be produced by reducing iron 3 oxide with hydrogen. And they give us a reaction equation. So here we see iron oxide solid reacting with hydrogen gas to give us iron and water. And they give us a delta, D, a delta H naught and a delta S naught for, both of the, for this equation. And it says determine whether this reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees C. Okay, so I'll give you a second to try this one and I'll come back and go over it with you. Okay, so let's work this one out. So here they're just asking us basically to calculate delta G. Okay, so they've asked us, is this spontaneous at 25C? And we're just going to, they don't tell us what temperature these are, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that those are at room temperature. 
Okay, so they just want us to calculate delta G. So the first thing we have to do is, of course, we want to put our temperature in terms of Kelvin. So remember that T in Kelvin will just be equal to 25 degrees C plus 215, okay, which is going to give us 298. I'm sorry, not 215. I don't know what I was thinking there. 273, which gives you 298K. Okay. Then we can just set up our equation here. Remember that delta G is going to be equal to delta H minus T delta S. And they've given us delta H, and they gave us delta S. So all I really have to do is plug these numbers in. Since we went ahead and converted our temperature, oop, I just turned my page there. Okay. Didn't work. Okay, so let's just plug our numbers in. And remember, these are at standard conditions, so they all have little knots above them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so let's plug in our numbers. Okay, so and this is a G. It doesn't quite look like one. Let's make it look like a G. It's a little better. Okay. So let's plug in our numbers. So delta G is going to be equal to, just bring down our delta H. So 98.8, and that's in kilojoules. And minus 298. Kelvin times our delta S, 141.5 joules per 1 Kelvin. Okay, just writing that out. And then we can convert this times, because we want it in kilojoules, so we can just say times 1 kilojoule for every 1,000. Okay, so just checking our units here. Kelvin will cancel with Kelvin. I'll grab a different color. Okay, so Kelvin cancel with Kelvin. Joules will cancel with joules. There's a thousand kilojoules and a thousand joules in a kilojoule, so that works out. Okay, so now we have kilojoules minus kilojoules, so that works. Okay, so if we plug that in. So we have 298 times 141.5, essentially divided by 1,000, okay, and then 98.8 minus that answer. Okay, so we end up with delta H. So we end up with, or excuse me, a delta G. Of 56.6 .6 kilojoules, which is greater than zero. So our delta G greater than zero. So no, not spontaneous. Okay, so that would answer the first half of the question. So let's take a look at the other half. Okay, so part B here asks us to estimate the spot, the temperature at which the reaction becomes spontaneous. Okay, so I'll give you a second to ponder on this one, um, and I'll come back, and I'll give you a hint, and then I'll give you another second. Okay, so the hints I wanted to give you on this one is that, remember that at temperatures where delta G is less than zero, we have a spontaneous reaction. So you can set this up. We can say delta G, oh, let me grab my pencil. 
Okay, so we can say delta g. And remember that's equal to so delta g naught. Go to delta h naught minus t delta s naught. Oh, I wrote that backwards in there. Okay, so if we know that temperatures below zero, we have a spontaneous process. Okay, then let's calculate at what temperature delta G is equal to zero. Okay, so that'll give us some frame of reference. Okay, so see if you can solve that, and I'll come back and we'll look at the solution. Okay, so let's just take this equation. Well, what we can say here is that we just let's rewrite our equation in terms of this. So we'll say delta H naught minus T delta S naught is equal to zero. And we'll just solve this for temperature. Okay, so the first thing we'll do, let's just add T delta S to both sides. Okay, so we end up with the equation of something like this. So now we have delta H equal to T delta S naught. Okay, so now we just need to isolate temperature by itself. Okay, so remember that's what we're really after here. Okay, so divide both sides by delta S. We end up with this. So we end up with scoot this up a bit. Let's end up with delta H naught over delta S naught equal to temperature. Okay, so now all we have to do is plug in those same values that we used for delta H and delta S before, okay, and see what temperature this would all be equal to zero. Okay, so I'll go back here, remind us. So we had values of 98, so I'll just rewrite those down here. So delta H naught was equal to 98.8 kilojoules, and delta S naught was equal to 141.5 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert um, this joules per Kelvin into kilojoules per Kelvin. So 141.5 joules per one Kelvin. So we're just going to multiply that by for every one kilojoule. We have, of course, 1,000 joules. So we end up with 0.1415 kilojoules per Kelvin. OK, so now all we have to do is just plug those in. OK, so keeping our delta H, 98.8 kilojoules. And just divide that by 0 0.1415 kilojoules per Kelvin equal to T. Okay, so we end up with temperature equal to 698 Kelvin. Okay, so at that temperature, delta G is equal to zero. So above 698 Kelvin, the process is spontaneous. Just sort of zoom out a little bit here. So you can see the whole page. Um, and again, I'll also be posting this along with the video links on the Blackboard so that you can have these solutions to download.
Okay, so moving on. We want to talk about Actually, we have another problem to solve first. Okay, so let's give this one a try. Um, and so before you get started, I just want to remind you that delta G is going to be equal to delta H naught of the system minus T of the S naught of the system. Okay, so the question asks us, iron metal can be produced commercially by reducing iron ore with carbon monoxide. Okay, so they give us the reaction here. And they ask us to calculate the standard free energy, delta G, for the reaction at 25 degrees C. And it wants to know, is this reaction spontaneous at that temperature? Okay, so this time they give us delta H of formation and they give us uh, entropy. Okay, so this time you have to calculate delta H of the system and delta S of the system. Okay, exactly the same calculations we've been doing. Okay, but now you have to sort of put them all together. So give this one a try, and then we'll work it out together. Okay, so let's go over this one. So it's a bit of a long problem. Um, really, it's more tedious than anything. Okay, so let's start from, again, we know that our delta G equation, so we need delta G equal to delta H naught for the system minus T delta S naught, and again, that's for the system. So we have to solve for two things. So first we need, well, it, either, either order you prefer, but we need delta H of the system, and we need delta T, of, or delta S of the system. Okay, so let's write out those two equations real quick. Okay, so recall that delta S naught for the system is going to be equal to total entropy for the products minus total entropy for the reactants. Okay, then our delta H will be similar. So we have delta H I'm going to put here for the reaction, okay, but this is also for the system, so I could just as easily write delta H for the system. So let's put that. Okay, and that's going to be equal to total entropy for the products, or enthalpy, I should say, minus total enthalpy for the reactants. It's very similar equations. Okay, so we just need now to solve for both of those and then combine them back to find our delta G. Okay, so in no particular order, I'm going to solve for delta S. Okay, so we need our reaction equation visible, and then we need our chart there. Okay, so let's start with just rewriting our equation. Now let's start to fill this in. So this is going to be equal to, okay, so again, we're starting with our products. Okay, so first product we have is iron. So we'll say two moles of iron times, and now we need, well, we're working with entropy. So I'm going to come up here and find the entropy for iron. Okay, so it's 27.3. That's going to be joules per mole. Kelvin, I'm so going to run out of room. Okay, 
then what else do we have? We have also three moles of CO2. Okay, so that's our first half, and then we'll say minus, and then our second half. I'll try to squeeze this in here if I can. Okay, so now our reactant side, so we just have one mole times, and we have iron oxide, okay, so that's 87.4. It's going to be plus. Now our CO. Carbon monoxide, three moles carbon monoxide times delta S, or just our S for carbon monoxide, 197.6 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so that's our product, our reactant side. Okay, so what you end up here is 695.4, and then checking our units here. Okay, so mole cancel with moles, mole cancel with moles, moles cancel with moles, moles cancel with moles. So you end up with joules per Kelvin. And that's going to be minus 680.2 joules per Kelvin. And this gives you 15.2 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so this is our delta S for the system. Okay, so we're going to need that later. Okay, so now moving on to second half here. Hopefully you could see all of that. I apologize if you couldn't. Here's the whole thing now. Okay, so we'll shift this up. Now we need to solve for our delta H. Okay, so delta H for the system will be equal to Again, total enthalpy for the products minus total enthalpy for the reactants. Okay, so just filling this in. We recall our equation here. down for us so we can remember everything. Okay, so first we're going to start from the products. So we're going to start from oh, pencil again, don't I? Okay, so first two moles of iron. So my delta H for iron, since again we're here, we're in the solid state, so this is just going to be zero. And that's kilojoules per mole. So that term would just be zero. Plus three moles of CO2, which has delta H of minus 393.5. Okay, so that's our first half, minus one mole of iron oxide, which is 824.2. That's kilojoules per mole. plus three moles of carbon monoxide, minus 110.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so in that problem earlier where I said, let's just take kilojoules, since even though they give us kilojoules per mole, this is why. Because if we were to do this in that problem, to go back and do that, that's always not, not always a safe assumption, but sometimes it can be. Okay, so here I get moles, cancel with moles, moles, 
there would be moles there, moles, moles. So moles would be there, and moles would be there. Okay. So really, you just end up with kilojoules. So it's kind of a safe assumption to make sometimes, not all the time. Okay, but that's why I did that before. Okay, so at the end, you end up with minus one one. 8.5, 0.5, and this is in kilojoules. It's going to be minus a negative 1155.7 kilojoules. And that will give you ultimately minus 24.8 kilojoules. And it's going to be your delta H naught for the system. Okay, so same react same equations we've been using. Just now we have to put them all together. Okay, so I'm going to give us a new page. Okay, so continuing the problem. Okay, so remember ultimately we're trying to plug this into this formula. So delta G equal to H naught for the system. Delta H not the system. Let me just start over. That's doesn't look good. So, oops. so delta G for the system is going to be equal to delta H not for the system minus T delta S not the system. Okay, and remember we calculated delta H of minus 24.8 kilojoules and we calculated delta S equal to 15.2 joules per Kelvin. So again, first thing, let's convert joules to Kelvin to just kilojoules per Kelvin. So 15.2 joules per one Kelvin. Let me just divide by a thousand. Sorry, not equal to. That would be silly. So you end up with 0 0.0152 kilojoules per Kelvin. Now we just have to plug in. So finally, we're nearing the end of the problem. And remember to convert your temperature to Kelvin, which is just 298, of course. So here we have delta G equal to, I'm just plugging back into our equation up there. So here we have minus 24.8 kilojoules minus 298 Kelvin times. 0 0.0152, and that's kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so let's check our units here. So here we left with just kilojoules. Here we cancel Kelvin with Kelvin. So we're just with kilojoules, so we can do this. Okay, so ultimately you end up with minus 24.8. minus 4.53, which will give you minus 29.33 kilojoules. Let me just erase that and start over. Okay, so we Calculated our standard free energy, so this is our delta G. Okay, and the question wanted to know, is this spontaneous? And we would say yes, because delta G is less than zero. So that would be our complete answer.
So I'll go back to the last page real quick so you can see the full answer. Let me just zoom out a little. And like I said, I will be posting these for you guys. Second page. Okay, so again, not really a difficult problem, more like a tedious problem. Okay, so you just have to sort of put all those parts together. Okay, so a few calculations, then put everything together, and in the end, you come up with delta G. Okay, so just putting all the parts together now. Okay, so going back to our slides here. Okay, so we have standard free energies of formation, delta G F. So just like you have delta H, delta H of formation, all these different things here, you have delta G. And you can find these on the internet or you can find values on your te in your textbook if you have one. Okay, but they're pretty really readily available. But just like uh, delta H of formation, if something like an element, so iron solid like we saw that time, we have delta G equal to zero, of formation, delta G of formation equal to zero for elements in their most stable state. Okay, so just like we have with delta H. And here's some values that you might find helpful. Um, you should be able to find a table like this either um, on ChemStack, somewhere like that, or in a textbook if you have one, or just looking up um, delta G values. Um, I can also go ahead and post, um, I have a very nice um, table that I can post that has delta H, delta S, delta G, everything put together. Okay, so I can go ahead and give that to you guys, and you'll have it for the exam as well. Okay, and so just like with the other, we can do the sigma notation with delta G. I think we've looked at this already. But just always remember it's going to be products minus reactants. Okay, so here we want to use the table of values to calculate the standard free energy change at 25 degrees C for the reduction of iron oxide with carbon monoxide. Okay, so this time we're going to use this form. Okay, so now we are just going to look up delta G values instead of having to calculate them every single time. Okay, and we're just going to use um, this basic sigma notation to calculate this. Okay, so we have our equation. Okay, so now we just set it up. So again, remember that these coefficients become coefficients here, your multiplication factor. Okay, so set up everything just like you did with delta H or delta S when you're using sigma notation. Okay, so 2 times delta G of formation for iron solid, and then plus 3 times delta G of formation of CO2, etc., etc. Just the same way we set it up before. Okay, and then plug in the numbers. Remember that, so here we have solid iron. So remember, it's just going to be 0 since it's elemental. Okay, then you would just go to your table and just grab the values you need. Okay, plug them in. Solve that little bit of math there. Okay, and you come up with the answer. Okay, so it turns out, so reduction of iron oxide with carbon monoxide, we have a delta G of minus 29.4 kilojoules. Okay, so pretty much a standard uh, sigma notation delta type problem. Okay, nothing too new there. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Okay, so let's give this one a try. So it says calculate delta G for the reaction with a combustion of one mole of methane using delta G of formation values for the reactants in the products. So give this one a try. Use that standard um, sigma notation formula, so just your delta formula, okay, and see if you can calculate this based on known values. Okay, so let's give this one a try together. Okay, so we want to grab our delta equations. Remember, oh, let me grab a pencil. I do that every time, don't I? Okay, so delta G for the reaction is just going to be equal to 
total gives free energy for the products minus total gives energy for the reactants. That is a delta. So it sort of looks like a volcano. Let me fix it. There we go. It's a little bit better, right? Okay, so now we just have to set up our equation here. That's our basic equation. So let's plug in what we know. Okay, so again, start from your products. Okay, so this becomes 2 moles times delta G for water plus 1 mole times delta G for CO2 minus, let's put that a little bit, a little bit further over, minus 1 mole times the delta G for methane plus 2 moles times the delta G of O2. Okay, so that's our setup. Now let's plug in what we know, and I'm going to move way over here so we don't run out of room. Okay, so this becomes 2 moles times delta G of water, so minus 228.6 kilojoules per mole, plus 1 mole times delta G of CO2, minus 394.4 kilojoules per mole. Okay, and then all of that minus 1 mole times the delta G of methane. Okay, so minus 50.9 kilojoules per mole plus 2 moles times delta G of oxygen, which of course is just zero since it's an elemental form. Okay, so that's our second half. And then doing that little bit of math there, you end up with minus 851.6 kilojoules minus negative 50.9 kilojoules, which gives you ultimately a delta G minus 800.7 kilojoules. Okay, so a lot easier when we have the, when we actually have the values, right? Okay, so there's your full solution. So jumping back to our slides, so last little bit we'll talk about firstly free energy and temperature, and then we're going to go all the way back. If you remember at the very beginning of the discussion, um, we were talking about um, eventually relating this to KEQ. So that'll be how we finish up. Okay, so the first thing here we have two parts to this equation. So our just basic delta G equation. There's actually two parts, and it's kind of obvious, right? So we have delta H minus T delta S. So we have two terms here. So the first one we call the enthalpic term, so delta H. Okay. Then we also have the entropic term, T delta S. So what's important about this? Okay, so it's not only important, delta G is not only related to enthalpy and entropy, what else do we have here? We have temperature, right? Okay, so it's important to understand that delta G is actually temperature dependent. Okay, so all of this times we've been talking about, you know, is it spontaneous at this temperature? Does it proceed spontaneously at this temperature, you know, at 298K? So it's important to understand that it is temperature dependent. Okay, and here's some little chart here that you can see. So if we have a negative delta H, positive delta S, but we have a negative T delta S, delta G will have a negative sign. So it is spontaneous at all temperatures. Okay, what if we have a positive delta H, a negative delta S, 
that gives us a positive t delta s term. So overall, delta g is going to be positive. So this is non-spontaneous. Okay, so if we, what if we have a negative delta h, negative delta s, so that gives us a positive t delta s. So this could be plus or minus delta g, so it may or may not be spontaneous, but at low temperatures, it's more likely to be spontaneous and non-spontaneous at high temperatures. Okay, so what if we have a positive delta h, positive delta s, we have an overall negative t delta s. Okay, again, this could be either spontaneous or not. Okay, so this time we have spontaneous at high temperatures, non-spontaneous at low temperatures. Okay, so that's just sort of kind of some logic behind, or not necessarily logic, but sort of just thinking about how do these signs affect. So notice this t delta s sign is very important. Okay, so this overall term, the sign of this becomes very important. And there's some examples down here. Okay, so we have things like ozone going to oxygen, and you can kind of go over these with, for yourself, but there's some examples. Okay, so this last little bit here, we're going to talk about how we relate Gibbs energy to our equilibrium constant. Okay, so we're going to come back full circle on this. Okay, so first of all, we've been talking a lot about um, G delta G naught, delta H naught. So we've been talking about these systems in standard state conditions. Well, what if they're not in standard state conditions anymore? Okay, so how does that affect our calculation? Well, we have this term now, or this equation. So now we can say delta G, I notice this time we're not at standard conditions, is equal to delta G at standard conditions plus R times T times the ln of Q. Okay, where R is just your basic uh, ideal gas constant, your gas constant. Delta G is a change in free energy under non-standard state conditions, so that's the only thing that's changed here. So the only thing that's changed is we don't have the little not symbol anymore. Okay, and then Q is still your reaction quotient. So just like we calculated Q before, or just the same way we've been setting up uh, these our equilibrium constants, all these different constants we calculated, Q is just going to be concentration of products of the concentration of your reactants. Just your basic Q, same that we've been talking about. Um, so this is in terms of natural log. You can also put this in terms of just your standard log if you would like. Um, notice you get this little constant up front if you do that. So in this form, it's delta G is equal to delta G naught plus 2.303 times R times T times the log of Q. Okay. So this is how we're going to calculate delta G if we're not at standard conditions. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So here it wants us to calculate delta G for the formation of ethylene from carbon and hydrogen at 25 degrees C. And they give us some partial pressures here. Okay, so we have 100 atm of H2, and we have 0 0.1 atm of ethylene. Okay, and they give us a delta G naught. Okay, so let's just set up our equation. Remember, delta G will be equal to delta G naught plus R times T times the natural log of Q. So the first thing we have to do is solve for Q. Okay, so remember, if we're talking about pressures, so here we're talking about gases, so our Q just becomes pressure of our products over the pressure of our reactants, and this time we have a 2 up front, okay, so we're going to square this. Okay, and remember, things like solids, pure liquids, don't play a part in our K equations or our Q equations. Okay, so we end up with a Q of 0 0.00001, okay, so pretty small Q. Okay, but that's not what it's asking us for. It's asking us to calculate delta G. Okay, so now we just plug in what we know. Okay, so they gave us delta G naught, so that comes here. This is just your gas constant, converting this joules to kilojoules, no big deal there, times your temperature in Kelvin, and then times the natural log of our Q. Okay, so just going through, solving all this, we end up with 68.1 kilojoules minus 28.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we end up with a delta G of 39.6 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so really no big deal there, just plugging in the delta G that they give us, gas constant, temperature that they gave us, okay, and then just knowing how to calculate Q. 
Okay, so let's put this into practice. So it says calculate the free energy change, delta G, for ammonia synthesis at 25 degrees C given the following partial pressure values. Okay, so now we're at 298K, same Haber synthesis. Now they give us a delta G value, they give us some pressures, and they want to us to calculate delta G at non-standard temperature and pressure. So I'll give this one a try. So let's take a look at the solution here. Okay, so just like the problem we just looked at, we're going to say, I do that every time. Say delta G. So our non standard conditions will just be equal to delta G naught. And this time I'm going to use this form plus 2.303 times R times T times the log. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is calculate Q based on what they gave us. So remember it's going to be pressures, since we're dealing with pressure this time, pressure of products over pressure of our reactants. These are all in ATM. I'm just going to save writing it for now. Okay, times 3.0, and this is going to be cubed due to our coefficient there. So we end up with a Q. 1.48 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so now we just have to plug into our equation. So we're going to say delta G is equal to our, the standard gives energy they give us minus 33.0 kilojoules per mole. And it's going to be plus 2.303. <clears throat> times 8.314, and that's joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so we need to convert this to kilojoules since that's what our delta G is in. So we'll just say times 1 over 1,000, since there's 1,000 joules per kilojoule. Okay, and that would be, that's, how good is it? So for one kilojoule, it's a thousand joules. Okay, times 298K. And of course, this will all be times the log of 1.48 times 10 to the minus 5. And then double checking our units here, uh, we're going to have Kelvin cancel with Kelvin. So we're left with joules cancel with joules. So we're left with kilojoules per mole. Okay, so if we plug all those numbers in, we end up with this. So we end up with minus 33.0 kilojoules per mole plus minus 27.6 kilojoules per mole. So you end up with a delta G. Sorry. So you end up with delta G equal to minus 60.6 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that one wasn't too bad. So the last little bit here, we're now going to take this same concept and we're going to tie it back all the way to our equilibrium constant. Okay, so that was putting in terms of Q, so not quite at equilibrium, but what if we are at equilibrium? Or what if we want to know what KEQ is? Okay, so given the other information. So just a brief reminder here, remember that if K is less than 1, we're going to move back towards the reactants. If K is greater than 1, we'll move towards the products. 
and if k is equal to 1, we're at equilibrium. So just a brief reminder there. Okay, so we can rearrange this equation or rewrite our Gibbs equation. Okay, we can write this for uh, KEQ. Okay, so we can say delta G, remember, is equal to delta G naught plus RT times ln of Q. Okay, so at equilibrium, remember, Q is equal to KEQ. So this is just by definition. If our Q is equal to our K, we're at equilibrium. And at equilibrium, remember, our delta G is 0. Okay, so now we can plug a few things back into this equation. Okay, so first we'll take our delta G equal to 0. Okay, and then we're going to say delta G naught, that stays the same, plus RT times a natural log. And now instead of saying natural log of Q, since we're at equilibrium, we'll say natural log of KEQ. We'll do the same thing here. So 0 is equal to delta G naught plus our log term here. And remember, we're turning K, or Q into KEQ. Okay, so rearranging, we can say delta G is equal to minus RT times a natural log of KEQ, or delta G naught is equal to our log term here times KEQ. So again, solving for KEQ, we can say that, and again, we're just, or solving for KEQ, we can say KEQ is equal to E raised to minus G naught over RT, or KEQ is equal to 10 raised to minus G naught over 2.303 times RT. <clears throat> and again, E just to get rid of the natural log, so you're saying E raised to, and then here 10 raised to just to get rid of the log, so 10 raised to that. Okay. So just two different forms. And then what this does is this allows us then to calculate KEQ based on delta G at a given temperature. Okay, so putting this into practice, here it wants us to calculate KEQ at 25 degrees C for the following reactions, or following reaction. And they give us calcium carbonate, giving us cal calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Okay, so then they give us some delta G naught of formation values. So first thing you need to do, calculate delta G. Okay, so use your delta equation or your sigma equation, however you want to call it. Okay, first calculate delta G. Okay, so again, just one mole, then times delta G of formation. So just like you did before, delta H, delta S, all these different things, just use your sigma notation there. Okay, so calculate delta G first. So you end up with a delta G, 131.4 kilojoules per mole. Okay, now we need to plug that in. Okay, so now we're going to ca calculate natural log of KEQ. So we'll grab this form of the equation. So delta G is equal to minus RT times natural log of KEQ. Okay, so rearrange. Natural log of KEQ is equal to minus delta G over RT. So now we just plug in what we know. We just calculated delta G, naught. Okay, then we know our gas constant, convert it to kilojoules, times our temperature. Okay, so we have a natural log. Well, we can just do the math there. So minus 131 over 2.478 kilojoules per mole. We have kilojoules per mole over kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we end up with a natural log of KEQ equal to minus 53.04. Okay, so just calculating KEQ. So take E of both sides. So E raised to both sides. So we end up with KEQ equal to E raised to the minus 53.04. So you end up with a KEQ of 9.2 times 10 to the minus 24. Okay, so a very small KEQ. So this reaction would lie more like in this direction. Okay, so one last problem to solve here. So methanol is an important alcohol used in manufacturing of adhesives, fibers, and plastics. And they give us the synthesis equation. Okay, so it says using the following data, calculate the equilibrium constant, okay, and kilojoules per mole. Or just calculate the equilibrium constant. They don't say kilojoules per mole. Okay, so again, your constant's going to be unitless. Okay, so calculate your equilibrium constant for this, given that information. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this one together. It's not as bad as it looks. Okay, so first thing we need to do is just write out our equation. So remember the natural log of KEQ is equal to minus delta G naught over R 
times t. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is calculate delta g. Okay, so we'll say delta g is equal to total Gibbs free energy for the products minus total free energy for the reactants. Okay, I will let you solve this one on your own, but you end up with delta G equal to minus 24.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So if you didn't get that, uh, you can email me if you have any trouble, okay, but hopefully you can come up with that on your own. Okay, so now we just have to plug into our equation. Okay, so grabbing our equation, natural log of KEQ will be equal to minus, minus 24.7 kilojoules per mole over okay, so we have 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, and we'll go ahead and convert that to kilojoules. So one kilojoule per 1,000 joules. And that's times our T, which is 298K. Probably draw a better K than that. Okay, so checking our units real quick. So here we would end up with kilojoules per mole. So we have kilojoules per mole divided by kilojoules per mole, which is good. That's what we need. Okay, so if you plug all this in, you end up with natural log of KEQ equal to 9.97 is what I came up with. So you're going to your KEQ and to get that you're going to so say E raised to this, E raised to this. So then you end up with a KEQ of equal to 2.1 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, so there's your full solution. Okay, so that will wrap up the chapter. Um, that's everything for thermo. I know this is a pretty dense chapter, um, but again, just keeping all of your variables straight, your delta H's, your delta S's, delta G's, entropy, enthalpy, Gibbs free energy, keeping all those things sort of straight in your mind, I think is the biggest challenge. Um, hopefully uh, seeing the math written out helps you guys. Um, if you do have any questions, Feel free to email me, um, stop by my office hours, um, just let me know. All right, see you next time.